It's a joy to be with you this morning. If you have Bibles, I'd invite you to turn with me to Psalm 119. Uh, I, I've known Michael for a long time, your president, but I've known his mother even longer. Uh, my wife is, the, is a teacher and the senior high uh, girls counselor at the high school where Michael's mother was the head of school. And so we have enormous regard for both Michael and his mother, Susan, and of course the whole family. And we keep up with Gordon College, even from Jackson, Mississippi. My, my wife did her seminary in this area just up the road at Gordon-Conwell Seminary. She fell in love with South Hamilton and Wenham and this, this whole area. So we, you're very much on our minds and hearts, even though we're a long way away in Jackson, Mississippi. And I've been looking forward for a long time to being here with you today. Now, you've just sung a number of times that your word will never fail me. And I hope you believe that. Uh, because it's true, and if that's true, we, we want to know how does that word help us live life. Uh, John Calvin once said that the Psalms give us the anatomy of all parts of the Christian soul. And what he means by that is the Psalms are a really good guide to what we ought to expect in terms of our Christian experience. I mean, think of it. Jesus used the Psalms to describe his own experience in life. And if Jesus could use the Psalms to describe his experience in life, then certainly the Psalms are a good guide for us in understanding our experience of the Christian life. So what does it mean to live by the book? I want to encourage you to think in terms of living by the book. Really, Psalm 119 is a psalm that celebrates how the psalmist loves the Word of God and how the Word of God helps him live. I want to look just at the very last section of Psalm 119 with you. You know it's an alphabetical or an acrostic psalm. It follows the order of the Hebrew alphabet, and in 22 sections, each of those eight verse sections begins with the same letter in the Hebrew alphabet, so we're right at the end of the Hebrew alphabet when we get to verses 169 to 176, and I can't even, even in this little section of Psalm uh, 119, I'm not going to be able to touch on all of the themes. But very briefly this morning, I want to point you to five themes that you meet in verses 169 to 176 that help you know how to live by the book. Before we read God's Word, let's pray and ask for His help and blessing. Heavenly Father, we do not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. The grass withers, the flowers fade and fall, but the word of our God stands forever. Sanctify us with truth. Your word is truth. All scripture is given by inspiration and is profitable for teaching, reproof, correction, training in righteousness that we may be equipped for every good work. So speak, Lord, your servants listen we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. This is the word of God. Hear it, beginning in Psalm 119, verse 169. Let my cry come before you, O Lord. Give me understanding according to your word. Let my plea come before you. Deliver me according to your word. My lips will pour forth praise, for you teach me your statutes. My tongue will sing of your word. For all your commandments are right. Let your hand be ready to help me, for I have chosen your precepts. I long for your salvation, O Lord, for your law is my delight. Let my soul live and praise you, and let your rules help me. I have gone astray like a lost sheep. Seek your servant, for I do not forget your commandments. Amen. And thus ends this reading of God's holy, inspired, and inerrant word. May he write its eternal truth on all our hearts. In this passage, I want you to see five ways that the psalmist helps us know how to live the Christian life by the book. And, and the first way is interesting. This psalm is about the scripture. It's about the word of God. It's about how the word of God is good and how it helps him. But did you notice that this section of the psalm begins by saying if you're going to live by the book, you're going to live by prayer. 
I don't know how it is for you, but I find it sometimes much easier to read and study the Bible than I do to pray. There are times when I get up in the morning and I can't, that whether it's the burdens of the day or problems in life, I can't get words to come out of my throat. I can find it easy to read the Bible, but then to turn around and begin to pray is a challenge. But the psalmist says, if you're going to live by the book, you live by prayer. Notice how he emphasizes that in this passage in a couple of ways. First of all, look in uh, verses 169, let my cry come before you. 170, let my plea or supplication come before you. Then verses 171 and 172, let my lips utter praise. 172, let my tongue sing. Notice language of cry and plea, that is the language of prayer. If you look in the Old Testament, cry and plea is typical language used for prayer in the Old Testament. And then praise and sing, it's, it's the language of doxology, which is another part of prayer. Prayer is made up of requests, petitions, and praises, thanksgivings, uh, giving glory and praise to God. And so the psalmist here in the very first verses indicates that a life, according to the word of God, is going to be a life of prayer. Here's the thing. You can believe the Bible. You can live by the Bible. That does not mean that you are not absolutely dependent upon God in prayer. Prayer is one of those things that reminds us that we are dependent. Uh, you know, sometimes we'll say to one another, um, I got this. Well, prayer is our way of saying, if you'll excuse the English grammar, I don't got this. Uh, prayer, prayer is our way of saying, I, I can't handle this myself. I need you, God. I'm dependent upon you, oh God. Without you, I can do nothing. This thing is impossible, but nothing is impossible with God. Prayer uh, puts us in the posture of dependence on God, and that's one of the secrets of the Christian life is depending on God. And so if you're going to live by the book, it doesn't mean, okay, I've read the Bible, I've got this. No, no, if you live by the book, you read the Bible and you see the Bible teaching you, you are dependent on God. And so you live by prayer. Second, living by the book doesn't mean that you will not face distress and danger. Did you catch that in verses 169 and 70? Let my cry come before you. And then look at again in verse 170. Deliver me according to your word. And then in verse 173, help me. And he even uses the language of save me in the passage. I don't know what's happening in this psalmist's life. I don't know whether he has a life-threatening illness I don't know whether he thinks he's dying. I don't know whether he's facing slanderers or persecutors or people who want to kill him. All of those things feature in other places in the psalm and in the larger psalms. I don't know what's going on in his life, but he is distressed. And you can hear it even in the language of verses 169 and 70. Let my cry come before you. Let my plea come before you. Um, if, if, if a friend of yours is diagnosed with breast cancer and you say to her, I was crying out to God for you in the night, you're, you're conveying that you, know, you didn't just sort of lift up a mumble a few words in prayer, but that you were in earnest prayer pleading for God for her in the midst of her trial. Or, or when a mother says to a straying son, son, I plea with you not to do that. You will ruin your life. Plea is very powerful language. So yes, cry and plea are the language of prayer, but it's pretty powerful language. It's not like saying, yeah, I'm praying for you. It's, that's very powerful language. And it lets you know that the psalmist realizes the danger that he is in. This is hugely important for us to realize because sometimes we think, okay, if, if, if I'm a good Christian, if I love Jesus, if I believe the gospel, 
if I try and live according to the Bible, everything will be okay in life. And then the world comes crashing down around our ears. And, and our typical reaction, if you're like me, is, what's happening, God? This isn't supposed to be happening. I love you. I'm trying to follow you. I'm trying to do what you want me to do. And my life is falling apart. And the psalmist is just here saying, expect danger and distress and trial and tribulation of the Christian life. You remember what John Newton sings in Amazing Grace? Through many dangers, toils, and snares, I have already come. The psalmist is saying, expect that as part of the Christian life. It's not like God suddenly is not in control when that happens. God is control, even in the midst of the distresses of life. So living by the book doesn't exempt you from distress and danger. It's another reason why we need to be dependent upon God in prayer. But there's a third thing I want you to see, and you're going to think I'm schizophrenic. <laughs> because the, the psalmist makes it clear here that living by the book means living a life of joy and praise. Now you're saying, look, wait a second, you just said that living by the book might entail distress and danger. Now you're telling me that it's a life of joy and praise. Yeah. I am. That's exactly what I'm telling you because the psalmist says that. Listen to the language that he uses. He says that he, his lips utter praise. His tongue sings the word. He longs for the salvation. His soul lives to praise God. Why is he so filled with joy and praise? Because the Christian life is a life of joy and praise. When I was a teenager, uh, a very famous pop uh, music star wrote a smash hit album called The Stranger. His name was Billy Joel. Uh, some of you may still listen to his music today. And uh, on that album, there was a song uh, called Only the Good Die Young, in which he was mocking a young Catholic girl who would not engage in immorality with him. And in that song, he says to her, trying to persuade her to uh, join in uh, his uh, in his revelry, he says, uh, I'd rather laugh with the sinners than cry with the saints. The sinners are much more fun. But I have found the opposite true. I have found that being with godly people, even in the hardest moments of life, filled with more joy and hope than I have ever encountered in the superficial happiness of the world. I remember being in the Blair Batson Hospital with Margaret, who was a nurse at Forest General Hospital, whose two-year-old son had fallen in a swimming pool, and they had found him, we don't know how many minutes later. Blue, oxygen deprived, he was airlifted to Blair Batson. He survived for two days, and then he died in Margaret's arms. I had the privilege to be there with Margaret. Now, Margaret was a, a woman who had had some really hard things in life, but she was a godly, mature Christian woman. And there we were, and if you imagine you're in a pediatric intensive care unit, those doctors have seen just about anything. They're pretty tough customers. But there was not a dry eye in that room. All of the doctors, all of the nurses were there in that room as Margaret held that little boy, and we watched the, the, the monitors just flatline. And then when he died... When he took his last breath, she looked up at me and she said, Ligon, can we sing the doxology? And I thought, I do not deserve to be in the same room with a woman like this. This woman is amazing. And my friends, I have met Christian after Christian after Christian after Christian like that all over the world. I would rather cry with those saints than laugh with sinners. But Margaret lived a life of joy and praise. When she asked me to sing the doxology, you know what came across my mind? I said, this is just like Job. The Lord has given. The Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And he fell down and worshipped God. You know, she, she knew that God, her creator, was her loving heavenly father who cared for her. And he deserved her praise even in that dark moment. She refused to live a life merely of mourning, but even in the hour of death, 
was ready to praise her loving God. My friends, the Christian life is a life of joy and praise even in the hard moments. And that's really the privilege when you get to watch believers worship God in the valley of the shadow of death. There is nothing like it in the world. It's the language of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, isn't it? We're not going to bow down and worship that idol. And God will deliver us. But even if he doesn't, we're not going to bow down and worship that idol. We're only going to worship the living God. That's power. The Christian life is a life of joy and praise when you live it by the book. There's another thing I want you to see here, though. Living by the book means coming to understand that God's commands are not meant to ruin your life. And a lot of us think that God's commands constrain us and repress us. It's as, 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 it's as if we think God is up there thinking, how can I ruin their lives? I know, I'll come up with these rules. No, no, the, the commands of God in the Bible, the, the rules that God gives us in the Bible are meant for our good. And the psalmist acknowledges that in this passage. Listen to the language. Your commandments are righteousness. All of them. Verse 172. 175. Your rules help me. You see the attitude of the psalmist? The rules that God has given in his word are not meant to ruin his life. They're meant to help his life. The psalmist understands that God's commands are good. And they're not only meant for his glory, they're meant for our well being. And so the psalmist has a very mature view. You know, a lot of times we have sort of an outback steakhouse view of Christianity. No, view, no rules, just right. Okay? And, and there's, there's this attitude that Christianity, you know, you'll hear it said, Christianity is not just a list of do's and don'ts. And of course, at one level, that's true. Christianity is not just a list of do's and don'ts. It, 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 at, the, at its very heart, the Christian uh, faith announces not what you're supposed to do, but what God has done for you in order to save you and bring you into eternal communion with him and equip you for service in this world and the life to come. Okay? But along with that, God gives us commands, and those commands are meant to help us do those things, not to harm us. And the psalmist acknowledges that. Your rules help me. Now, there's one last thing in this psalm that to me, it still baffles me every time I get to verse 176. Would you turn back to Psalm 119, verse 1? Because you are just not expecting Psalm 170, 119, verse 176 to come along. In Psalm 119, verse 1, you read, How blessed are those whose way is blameless, who walk in the law of the Lord. So who is blessed? People who walk according to the word of God. Now, for 175 verses, the psalmist talks about how wonderful it is to obey God's word. And then he ends with this. I have gone astray. What? <laughs> what? Hold on. 175 verses of how wonderful it is to walk with God according to his word. And you end like this. I have gone astray. I've gone astray like a lost sheep. And then here's, here's his last prayer. Seek your servant. Come find me. My friends, even if you live by the book, it does not mean that you are not going to come to places in your life when you're not going to need to call out to Jesus to come find you. This passage reminds me of Jesus' story of the lost sheep, doesn't it? And I love that story because when there are 99 safe sheep and one lost one, and he goes after the lost one, and he doesn't send a text message to the sheep to give him 12 tips on how to get back home. He goes after him, and he finds him, and he puts him over his shoulders, and he brings him back home. Now, the psalmist is saying this, even if you believe the word of God, even if you live according to the book, there are going to be times in life where you are going to be in places where if Jesus doesn't bring you home, you won't get home. And he's saying this, you call to Jesus, he will come get you and he will bring you home. Don't ever forget that, friends.
no matter where you are now or in the future, you call, seek your servant, come find me, Jesus, and he will get you and he will bring you home. Those are a few things that it means to live by the book. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this time in your word. I pray that these students would love your book and live by it, but mostly that they would always be ready to call out, seek your servant, come find me, Jesus, and bring me home. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for listening today. You're dismissed. Have a great day.